This episode of Primitive Culture is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. Open your mind to the past. Oh, this may mean something. I've been coerced into watching tonight's movie. You do have books in the 24th century. It's a primitive culture. I'm just trying to blend in. Some people think the future means the end of history. They haven't run out of history quite yet. Hello, Trek FM listeners. It's Duncan here from Primitive Culture. I am at Destination Star Trek. Uh, just in the queue to get in. We've been queuing quite a while, but finally it seems to be moving, so we're starting our own trek into the exhibition hall. I'm here with Carlos Miranda, frequent contributor uh, to Primitive Culture. How are you doing, Carlos? I'm, I'm great. I'm hanging out with you, and we're at a Star Trek convention. Uh, I, like, life doesn't get any better. <laughs> That's good to hear. Um, it's been a bit of a, a chaotic one, I think, this year, because they've had a lot of cancellations, I think, due to COVID and so on. This was meant to be the big Voyager celebration, um, but a lot of the Voyager cast have ended up cancelling. So I think it, it'll be interesting to see whether this is a slightly more muted, uh, slightly more intimate gathering than maybe we're used to from previous years. But there may be a positive in that as well. Yeah, I mean, let's see what happens. I, I'm extremely disappointed, and you know, I, I understand all the cancellations. Like, if, you, if you're going to have that many cancellations because of a global pandemic, like, I mean, it, it makes all the sense in the world. You know, it's a shame how it was communicated to us fans and things like that. But we're here. It's going to be fun, and I do think it's going to be a lot smaller, more intimate. It's a good word for it. More muted than previous years. But you know, uh, I'm here for it. It's going to be great. Let's let's. We're at a surgery convention. Now, you were telling me a minute ago, um, you've been coming to conventions for, what, about 30 years? Three decades? Is that right? Correct. I am about, I am 39 years old. I am about to turn 40 next May. And my very first charging convention, I was, I was 10. Um, and it was, my, we, were li- we spent like two years living in Houston, Texas, and I was in Houston. And I had, I had I was obsessed with Star Trek, and in in, a, in like the Next Generation magazine that advertised for a convention, and it was in this in a Hilton. I'll never forget. It was tiny, and it was took place the summer in. It was like May or June, the summer between DS Nine seasons one and two, and Next Generation season six and seven. And the two guests were Marina Sirtis and Armin Shimmerman. And it was it was Armin Shimmerman's like one of his very very first conventions. And it was, I was 10 years old and it was amazing. And I was so excited. I couldn't, I didn't sleep the night before. And like I, and it was just, I mean, I actually still have the, the two signed postcards from both, both of them. And I met Marina Sirtis, I, like one of these DST ones. And so, and it's the same picture that she signed, but like 28 years apart. Wow. So amazing. So yeah, I've been, I've been coming to charter conventions for 30 years. That's incredible. Well, I can't quite claim to go that far back. I did go to one as a kid, which which was quite an amazing convention. It was when they used to do them at the Albert Hall in London. Yeah. Um, and so that was quite an impressive one. And it's interesting, talking about guests who it's their first convention, I yeah. think you always get... Uh, that, that's always quite a nice experience to see them experiencing it because yeah. they're really starting to see, you know, having signed up to Star Trek, they may have been fans or they may not. They probably haven't been spending their life going to Star Trek conventions unless they're uh, Noah Averbach cats who I think yeah. may well have been with yeah. his family. But for the most part, they're not. And you, you really get that sense of them thinking, oh, my God, you know, what have I let myself in for? Because yeah. I remember that convention at the Albert Hall, uh, Ethan Phillips was there. And this was before anyone had seen Voyager. So I think Voyager was about to debut. Yeah. And he was great. And the, yeah. the funny thing is, a lot of people hate Neelix. I've never had a problem with Neelix. And I think part of that is because I sort of saw Ethan Phillips first. And yeah. He seemed like such a nice guy and yeah. so funny and also so kind of bamboozled by the yeah. whole experience. Yeah. 
that it really made me feel very uh, warmly towards him when I saw him on screen playing yeah. his character. So it's interesting. I think there are a few new cast members who are going to be here. They may have done some in the States, I guess, already at this point. But yeah. um, we'll definitely have to look out for them and how they how they respond it, it, to the whole experience. How, how shell-shocked they are by yeah, this exactly. whole it is, it is, it is. I mean, there's a lot of people in costume. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's definitely a thing going to... Because I know a lot of people who watch Star Trek and enjoy Star Trek and they would say they're fans of Star Trek but would never come to a convention, they find that, like, it's not that it's a bridge too far, but it's, like, too intense. And I see that, and I get that. You know, you just look around, and they're, I mean, these are our people, don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking it, but there's are people that this is, this it, they're intense. And I, and, I, and I see that, and I see that. <laughs> Six cosplays, you know, exactly. changing, changing, every, changing every every couple every of hours. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, no, but it's going to be great, and I look forward to hanging out with you and uh, seeing what kind of uh, good trouble we can get into. Cool. Well, let's see what we can find as we head inside. I'm here with Rashid, uh, star of Twitter, and now gracing the pages of the new Star Trek Explorer magazine. Well, thanks very much for that. <laughs> yes, uh, Star Trek is such a huge part of our life, and it's been wonderful to be featured in the magazine. Obviously, made some great friendships, and the series means such a great deal to me. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. I'm really, really pleased about it. You've been doing a lot of uh, sort of meeting and greeting uh, of various Twitter people. I'm quite impressed because I always struggle to remember who's who and to like match up faces to names and so on. But you seem to have got that down pat. Yeah, I don't know why. I really always would be good with names and faces and people. And um, I've, always, I've always had a good memory like that. So it's never been a problem for me. People say to me, like, how do you remember so many people on Twitter like that? Well, I, just, I, just, I just remember them. It's like, our conversations and the t- what we talk about so I just, just tend to have a good memory about it really and how are you finding the convention so far it's been fantastic last year obviously I was so disappointed missing out I was supposed to go to Destination Star Trek in Germany and London but right. but coming this year has been great seeing my friends seeing the cast again of the Voyager cast and it's, it's, it's been glorious I, I'm, I'm just so glad to be here this three days has been wonderful absolutely wonderful looking fantastic. forward to tomorrow well have a good time thanks for thanks, 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 Duncan so I'm here with Nick Jones, who is the editor of the brand new shiny Star Trek Explorer magazine. Uh, extremely shiny. Yeah, I've got hold of a copy. Uh, it, it looks gorgeous. Um, it's been quite a while you've been working on this one, right, Nick? It was the end of... Um, oh, God, what year are we in? It's 20, 2021, isn't it? It was the end of... The end of yeah, the end of... Yeah, the end of 20... Yeah. It was... Well, it's when the pandemic struck, we kind of... The magazine was still going at that point, and we kind of... But like all publishers, everything kind of everything sort sort of went out of whack, and everything slowed down, and getting issues out became more and more difficult. And there was big there was big gaps between you know in 2020 there was there was quite some I think there was quite a significant gap between two of the issues, um, and then it um, but then it came towards um, 2021, and we got and uh, with so much new Star Trek around, and with so many new shows launching, obviously we got Discovery, new season of Discovery, we got Prodigy starting up, we've got Strange New Worlds in the in the in the wings, and Picard's uh, second and third seasons, and of course Lower Decks, and you know, and uh, Short Treks as well. It it was like this is you know this rather than just get back to doing Star Trek magazine it's the time it seemed like the time, right time to have a rethink and, and you know reassess what we were doing and then uh, and relaunch the magazine so we did so we did we cut we the last issue of Star Trek magazine came out at the start of 2021 and then and then we just started working on what we wanted to do for the new magazine we were obviously talking to CBS a lot and they had some ideas about what they wanted to do uh, one of the big things that we all wanted to do was introduce some fiction into the magazine, short stories. So we uh, we talked about that and what we could and couldn't do and how that would work. Um, and also, uh, come up, we came up with some ideas like the, we've got a new section called Inside Trek, which is a magazine within a magazine. So 16 pages in the centre of the magazine. Um, we, uh, the first one's on James T. Kirk. Each one will be on a particular subject from Classic Trek. So that's a permanent kind of Classic Trek uh, part of the magazine so yeah uh, some of the some of the things that we've got in the magazine are holdovers from the previous previous magazine uh, we've got things like Larry Nemechek's Fistful of Data and, and Chris Dow's technology column and they're you know they're, they're 
they're things that were always working in the magazine you know if, it's, if it ain't broke don't fix it so we we kind of carried on with those but there's there's more fan stuff in there actually as well there's there's um, there's a section called trek through life which is uh which a guy called jay stoby does and he's been involved with the magazine for a little while and he uh he, he just gets stories from fans about you know about their what they're up to cosplay uh the kind of stuff they just get togethers you know and also uh, particularly with the pandemic you know that kind of thing became very important for people just online meetings zoom meetings between fans and between you know friends so um there's more of that sort of thing in there there's just you know just a lot of new stuff in there but just to just to kind of give it a, a new a new look and a, as you say very no new shiny look for all the new shows that are coming along so yeah yeah, it, it, it's amazing. I, I noticed Jay had written a few things. He's quite active on Trek Twitter. And I saw um, Rashid, who was here at, still on weekend, I think, but I ran into him yesterday, also quite active on Trek Twitter. So it's nice to be able to bring in those elements that I yeah. guess weren't a part. Certainly when I, used to, when I used to read it, it was Star Trek Monthly. I know it's been through at least one reinvention even since then. But um, I guess bringing it you know trying to work out what does the magazine do in an era where so much is online yeah. and, and so much more there is so much more interaction between exactly. you know even the actors and so on you, you know we can tweet at them and you might get a response yeah. you can kind of have a conversation that way yeah, I mean, so what does a magazine do you know what I mean it has yeah, to yeah, well, Jay, uh, some, of, some of what Jay's doing he's bringing some of that in he's got I think in the first issue he's got um, he had a little bit from um, Bob Picardo about some um, charity initiative they were doing I think he had Nana, Nana Visitor I think in uh, in first issue as well just to, I get as part of the kind of fan thing that he was doing he was bringing them in as well so yeah I mean I was editor of Star Trek monthly going back way back you it know to be very young uh, well, maybe it went for a lot longer than when I oh uh, well no this is year, year, two, <laughs> I was, it was year 2000 when I was the editor originally right, yeah. so for a couple of years back then and um, more sort of mid 90s Okay, so just before yeah, when Daryl or yeah, John were the yeah. No, I was, I was, yeah. So that was when, and that was very different then. We'd, that was when I first started at Titan, who published Star Trek Monthly. I think we had one one machine that had the internet, and no, no one, yeah, no one else. Now, I mean, obviously the internet had been around for a while, but no, no one was really that plugged into it at that point. I don't, certainly not in my experience. I mean, it wasn't that long before that I was writing on a typewriter. So you know, it was, um, that, that, that does date me, but. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so the magazine now, trying to do a magazine now as opposed to then is a very different proposition. Like you say, this social media has changed everything. So, um, so trying to trying to introduce an element of that to the magazine, as uh, and you know that that feeds back as well. You know, Jay's on social media all the time. He's on Twitter all the time. You kind of uh, so it kind of feeds both ways. People, you know, we, he does things that appear in the magazine, things that he does in the magazine feed back into Twitter and to, into Instagram and Facebook. So. You know, uh, I mean, I was doing a thing even in the last version of the magazine where I was uh, putting questions on the uh, Star Trek Facebook page. I just put, I just ask a question and then get responses from readers and run those in the magazine. So, so um, in the magazine rather. So, you know, I was already doing some of that, but we're certainly leaning more into that now. Yeah. And you've got Ian Spelling as well doing the kind yes. of big. I see, he's done quite a few of the big kind of in-depth interviews with the cast as well. That's yeah. obviously a kind of uh, a core part of the magazine going back, you know, many decades. Yeah, Ian's. I mean, Ian's been with the magazine possibly longer than I have. I, don't, I think. I think he was. I think he was doing interviews even before I started on the magazine. So, but then that's just true. Larry Nemechek as well. You know, Larry's been on the magazine for a long time. So that's the thing. It's a it's a nice mix at the moment of um, of seasoned. So we say <laughs> season writers and, and new writers, but uh, but yeah, no, he's. I mean, Ian is still, you know, he's so plugged into yeah. the title. I mean, when it comes to yeah, so I mean, he can get hold of pretty much any Star Trek actor. Yeah. You know, it's it's fine for him. It, it becomes more tricky on the on the new shows because we can't just go to the actors. We can whereas he might know them and will have interviewed them more than once. We have to do everything through CBS. It's the nature of a licensed magazine. So become, there's an extra layer in between the two. So that's always, not always straightforward, but um, that's part of the challenge. So. Do you have a lot of interaction then with CBS? Is that yeah, you mentioned well, I mean, John they, Van Sitters was here yeah, earlier? Is yeah. that the kind of point of contact? Is that yeah, how John's, you? John is one of them. Is another. Uh, um, on my main point of contact is uh, Marion Caldry, and she's been again. She's another. I don't want to say old hand, but she's been. You know, uh, she's been. In, yeah, she's yeah. been at CBS for quite a while. So. John, uh, Marion, uh, and uh, and a few other people as well. Arisa, Arisa Kessler, she's been there a long time. So when we were when we were reworking the magazine, it was 
It was uh, Marion and Reese that we were mostly talking to about about that sort of stuff. John John gets involved sometimes, but he's um, got. I mean, they've, they've all got a lot on their plates, but he's got. He's got his fingers in a lot of. Well, he's because he's in Alex Kurtzman's yeah. office half the time, so he kind of yeah. he's kind of like a go between between the production side and the license side, which is my side. So um, so he's he doesn't get as involved as he once did, but. Um, so yeah, he was, and the other, I mean, the other guy was um, uh, who uh, used to be involved as well was um, Bill, a guy called Bill Burke, who um, um, uh, one of the, right. I think about is it was yesterday at the t- uh, talk or one of the talks they they mentioned him because he died recently. So that was a that was a real shame. But he was a key guy as well. He was certainly a key guy at uh, Destination Star Trek and, and events because he was, you know, he was a real kind of make things happen sort of guy so yeah. he'd put people together he'd kind of you know uh, put deals together he was you know, he was a genius for that sort of thing so yeah it was a, he was that was a sad loss but so but yeah we I talked to you know everything everything in the magazine has to go through CBS so I mean I've been doing it long enough that I know what I can get away with so uh, <laughs> yeah. so that makes it easier yeah. uh, if you know if somebody else might not, not be aware of the of the the boundaries and how far you can go. Even then, there are times when we push things or try and do things, and we get a little bit of. Uh, can you share any examples uh, of when they push? Really that? <laughs> no. Thought you no, might say I that. Mean, it's, it's worth asking. It's not. I mean, it's not ter- really terrible yeah. things. It's just little things that they go. Oh, maybe you know, some things are slip. Some things do slip through occasionally. The, 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 the odd quote has been known to slip through, and uh, people at CBS have suddenly gone. Oh my god! Uh, so that has happened in uh, my experience, but that's that will all happen. There does, you know, people are just people. You can't, no, you know, there's no, you know. Sometimes we, the well, a good example is we, you know, we schedule the magazine to come out roughly when new seasons are starting and that kind of thing, and also around events as well. But um, you know, if we can have a magazine out when Discovery is just about to air, or when new season of Picard is coming out then that's great but sometimes that can go slightly awry because you know we think our magazine's coming out you know two weeks after the premiere and it turn, then the premiere gets pushed back and that's where you that's where you can see what problems might start to arrive nobody's fault it's just the way it goes sometimes and in the grand scheme of things it doesn't really matter it's you know it's all publicity so you know it's these things get forgotten but yeah it's you know cbs are and Par- well, I guess they're Paramount now. Uh, I can never k- keep it straight whether they're CBS or Paramount. Or they're all one happy uh, family, I think. Yeah, again, it used to be two they? very distinct things, yeah. but but now it's yeah, now it's all, uh, all one thing again, Second isn't it? Marriage. Yeah. yeah, but uh, no, they're great. They're, I mean, I've got a, I've got a good relationship with Marion, and uh, she's pretty, you know they're all easy to deal with. They're all they all and they're, and on the PR side of things as well. Ian talks to. The, um, the PR people about setting up interviews and we try not to hassle them too much because they've got a lot of things to deal with uh, but uh, they, they've been really accommodating as well so you know no complaints there we get you know we get some we, in the second issue we've got Jerry Ryan and uh, who else we've got Annie, Annie Wershing who's the new uh, board queen she's in the second issue Akiva Goldsman we got an interview with him in the second issue so you know and that's all thanks to CBS and thanks to the PR people so you know I'm not I'm not going to complain about that <laughs> <laughs> you scratch their back yeah, and, you know exactly. yeah 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 and tell me a bit more about the fiction because you've got um James Swallow you've got Una yeah. McCormack yeah. you've got Lisa Clink as well yes, who I yeah, think yeah. you know who obviously we think of as a screenwriter more than a short story writer I guess but you're kind of bringing in some of these big hitters for the fiction yeah I mean that's more Jonathan Wilkins than me because uh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm the editor of the magazine but Jonathan is running the fiction side of the thing Jonathan's been at Titan up quite a while and he's he used to be the editor of, um, of uh, Star Wars Insider magazine and he still oversees a lot of the specials that they do so uh, but he's t- he's kind of he's kind of spearheaded I mean I get involved in the fiction a little bit but um, he's he's the one who's kind of um, going out there and getting writers, I've suggested a few people to him as well. So we've got some nice, we've got some interesting people coming up too. Um, but yeah, no, he's, he, 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 we're quite pleased with with, uh, with who we got so far. We want to get some new voices in there as well. Um, it takes time with, with, uh, because, unlike the fe- you know all the features that I deal with in the magazine, well, I pretty much know what what CBS are going to be okay with. Um, with fiction, it's until you get it in, you, you don't really know. You know what it's going to, how this is going to go down. The advantage of using Una and, and James, James, I know, I know for a long time because he used to write for Star Trek Monthly way back. He was doing reviews yeah. uh, in, in the magazine. That's how he got 
you know, started as a, a novelist. He was doing that because he, via via the reviews he was doing on the magazine, he got a story credit in Voyager eventually, um, and he wrote about that during you know while I was editor of Star Trek Monthly back then as well. But um, people like that, we they you know CBS know them. They know what they can do. They know yeah. they're good. So and Lisa obviously you know uh, they know they know she's good. So that's uh, that's fine uh, when it comes to writers who haven't done Star Trek fiction before that's where it, just, it takes a little bit of time you know there's, there's bound to be a bit ba- a bit of back and forth and also you know in, in terms of the, what we want to do with the stories and the th- you know we're trying to introduce a few they're, they're separate short stories I and mean, each one is an individual story in its own right but we're, we're trying to introduce a little bit of a theme between some of them so that down the line um, they'll be collected down the line um, and then you will start. Then you will see some of the linking things between. Them. That's the idea, anyway. You're not going to get into a sort of Dickens-style serialized, uh, no, you know. No, be, no not to that extent. No, no, no. <laughs> Certainly not to that extent. No, uh, no. We don't. We, it's not going to be like a, it won't end up being a, a novel or something because yeah. the novels are covered. You know, that's yeah. that's uh, uh, so I'm just doing the novel. So that's you know, we're not going to be stepping on their toes at all. But uh, although their continuity is coming to an end yes, now, true, isn't yes, it? Yes, so yes, I don't yes, know whether your yes. so your short fiction. Yeah. is still playing in those you know the sort of legacy Trek it's area not, as much as the really new stuff right something we've got into with CB I mean the people writing the stories know Trek you know Una and Jim and um, Lisa that they know and Chris Cooper who's doing he's been doing some as well who's the editor of the magazine Star Trek magazine before me he's doing some fiction as well because he's written uh, he's written uh, uh, fiction before so um they all know. They all know Star Trek. They all know, they all know the canon, so they're not. We're not too worried about the the novel side of the canon. So, which is, and I know the two don't always, you know, meet. So, um, I think it, you know, like John Van Sitters was saying earlier in his panel, you know, if for for fans, if you think it's canon, if you if it works for you, then it's canon. So, you know. It, it, People get too happy about that sort of thing. I think so. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, if the, if the story, if it's a good story, and if it works, if it's a good Star Trek story, and it works as Star Trek, then you know it's fine. So it feels like these days Star Trek is maybe moving a bit more towards that sort of Doctor Who approach to canon, where it seems a little bit. Uh, we're trying not to get too het up about yeah. it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Whereas in the past, it could be quite. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are some fans who are still very, very, uh, you know, serious about what is and what isn't canon. In fact, I know they are because we get, we get, you know, people yeah, writing into so people writing into Larry Nemechek about it. But uh, uh, and he's, he's, you know, his job is to try and work out where things fit into canon. But um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's not. It's, it seems to be the case if you look at like, DC Comics as well. What they've been doing recently, they seem less concerned about what is and what isn't canon, where things fit, where you know, if so and so was so old here, here how old? No, they're just going look. It all happened. They're all stories. It's it all counts in some way. So just enjoy it for what it is. And I think that's the, that's the best way to approach this stuff. I think is if I know I know you know there there is always that impulse of you know. Uh, is this really can? Does this really count? Does this really mean something? But well, with something like lower decks as well, you've kind of got that on a weekly basis, haven't you? This sort of question mark: is this is this real on some? Yeah, yeah, and that and lower decks, as far as I'm aware, is completely canon. So you know, so it's so you know, it's uh, and they're taking all sorts of chances. But <laughs> so, so um, yeah, no, it's it, it's just you know, if it's, if they're good stories, then I don't think you really need to worry about that stuff too much. So when can we expect to see this first issue on the magazine stand? Well, it's out. It's out in the states. Uh, oh, next week, I think actually, uh, and in the UK a few weeks after that. There's a little, there's a little bit of a lag. Uh, so yeah, so this yeah next certainly next week in America, and I think it's end of the month here, maybe start of next month. And what about issue two? Is is it going to be monthly or quarterly? Uh, no, or it's quarterly. It's every well, I say every three months. It's not. It's it's it's, it's, it's uh, there's slightly shorter gaps and larger gaps between because as I say, we try and time it to. Uh, so Picard starts in February, so there'll be an issue just before that. So a second issue comes out just. Be- I think it's just before the, uh, the first uh, uh, second, sorry, second season of Picard, isn't it? So yeah, um, that comes out then, and then. We have another one in April, I think, April, May. So, um, 
it's yeah i mean it will move around a little bit i mean what some you know after last year when we we never quite knew when when a magazine was actually going to be able to print it it's you know you have to you have to be a little bit more flexible now there's all sorts of supply issues as well less so for magazines but um but certainly in terms of books and comics and that sort of thing you know, all sorts of people are having issues with paper so and 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 that, and that kind of supply stuff so you know touch wood we're, we're okay so far but there's no guarantees that's going to continue to be the case so but that's the that's the rough plan anyways it must be quite nice not having that kind of week uh, not weekly what monthly do you know what i mean like yeah. having previously had that you know it was like i say it was star trek monthly when i read it so there are very fixed deadlines and it's all very regimented yeah. now it seems like you've got a little bit more flexibility obviously you're yeah. going to have your deadline set in yeah. but at the same time you can spend a bit more time crafting each yeah no issue. it's it's, it's uh, yeah in theory yes <laughs> in, pra- <laughs> in practice yeah. uh, what, what what usually works out is we finish an issue off and then there's a delay at the end so right. we probably don't gain any time as a result but you know I plan way in advance anyway so so uh, it, yeah in that, in that sense it does help because I can look further ahead we've got four issues a year I can work out roughly what I want to get in that issue and then just you know and then everything changes at the last minute no no, no uh, roughly the plans stay the same we never you know some interviews might happen some interviews might not we might have to switch things around we're not so much when I was the, the last version of the magazine I was kind of tying it to a theme every issue so every issue would be something on like the a Borg theme or uh, you know uh, I think we did a Discovery Bridge Crew special that kind of thing we're not so much tied to that this time so we can there's a bit more flexibility but even so I'd still like it to be you know if Picard is Card season two is coming. I'd still like it to, to have that focus. So, I know Strange New Worlds will have you know stuff around that. So, um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, I mean, deadlines are all my life, so you don't have to talk to me about that. I've, uh, I used to work in a weekly magazine, and that's uh, that's uh, yeah. when, you, when you've done that, then you, then you know <laughs> deadlines because that's where that's where my uh, uh, I start getting headaches. Kind of uh, the deadline was on on Wednesday. I still get headaches on a Wednesday. So wow. yeah, yeah. It's, uh, that's the effect it had on me. Okay. So yeah, I, uh, the deadlines on Star Trek, on uh, Star Trek Explorer, are, are a lot easier to deal with. So yeah. I've got other deadlines that, you know, uh, on other things that uh, are a bit more tricky than that. So yeah familiar with all that thank you nick it's right. great to talk to you and congratulations on the new magazine thank you very much i'm here with john and olivia from i quit star trek uh, on day three day two for you two i think day of three, destination four. star trek convention you haven't quit the f- convention so far no oh, yeah that was slight trepidation <laughs> am i allowed to diss uh the the convention on this? I, I think, I, I mean, I might not, but I think you can get away with it, probably. <laughs> there could probably be, like, a little bit more. <laughs> but I, it's, it's really great to see everyone again. The, re, the, the reuniting is the highlight of it all. Yeah. I mean, this is a smaller convention than we used to, I think, because you were here a couple of years ago, right? In 2019. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's definitely... That. I was um, busy doing other things. Do you want to elaborate on that? No, <laughs> no. I, I, I do. Okay, okay, fair enough. Now, Olivia, I'm kind of interested to talk to you because I saw you two at the um, Prodigy official premiere uh, last night, and I know you are a massive Murph fan. What was it like seeing Murph legally, at least, for the first time on screen? My legal reunion with Murph. Um, beautiful. I, I, he, you know, he deserves to have be up on that big screen. You know, little icon. <laughs> He's very cute. I He's very cute. I think we need to run, we need to all remember that Murph is voiced by Parry the Platypus. By who? The guy who voiced Murphy is Dee Bradley Baker, whose other voice cult roles include Parry the Platypus and all of the clones on the Star Wars The Clone Wars TV show. But mainly Parry the Platypus. So that noise is also the, you know, the, I can't, I'm not doing the platypus noise. This is going amazingly deep. I wasn't expecting to have a, a, a chat about Murph casting, but... This is the kind of shit you get if you know, you listen to I Quit Star Trek. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, Prodigy is an interesting one, I think. I mean, I don't know if I should be confessing this. I have seen more than those two episodes. I don't know whether you guys I have. Olivia might be legally, uh, you know, obliged to... Hypothetically, seen multiple episodes. Hypothetically, yeah. yeah hypothetically. hypothetically, we have seen Murph. <laughs> <I don't> <laughs> do a little bit more <laughs> yeah 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 how do you feel about the show in terms of where it seems to be going after i think it's four episodes we've had so far isn't it 
Um, yeah, I'm enjoying it. I, I, I think it's like very light. I, I, I love to see that it's like, you know, a way of getting the kids into Star Trek. I, I don't understand how anyone could be like negative about something that's clearly bringing together all these other parts of the fandom. And it's, it's going to be beautiful. I, I can't wait for the next gen. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little bit like whenever anyone has anything bad to say about it. It's like, it's children's television. Get a grip. <laughs> but it's been very enjoyable to watch. And like all kids' television, it makes you laugh and happy, and it's just fun, it's exciting, it's colourful and engaging. And I love the art style. And I like the animation style. So I'm look, I've enjoyed what I've seen, apart, supposedly, and I'm looking forward to seeing more. So who's going to be the first person to bring an episode of Prodigy onto I Quit Star Trek? And what kind of a reception are they going to get? Um, I did actually quit Star Trek in the, when, I, when I watched the first episode. Right. What, what did I do? What happened? I think it was something like Murph fell across the ship or something, and I was like, "How dare they put him in any danger at all?" Yeah. Yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. I've got to quit. That about right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in episode four, he's in a bit of peril again. I yes, think he, he ends up said, well, crashing I, on a planet. Yeah. And- <laughs> <laughs> when we were watching it, well, we were uh, supposed hypothetically watching it together, and I missed the first ten minutes, and I come in and I join the hypothetical call, and I was like, <laughs> "What's going on?" <laughs> no one explained, so I will have to go back and watch that legally or um, hypothetically at some point. But it looked very fun, the latest episode. It was an interesting cliffhanger, and it, it was good. The serious storytelling for kids, you know, they're not, wait, they're not giving the kids the B-rate stuff, which is great. And it's definitely a contrast to the last time Star Trek did a show for kids with the animated series, which I think more, more legitimately might find its way onto your podcast at times, right? I would love to see animated series energy on Prodigy. Let's, let's really bring it in there. Let's what, what the it real deal. Is we need some big Spock. Yeah, giant Spock. We need... We've had, yeah, we had, we had the corpse, God rest his soul, of giant Spock. We need some space slugs that steal Scotty. Yeah. Um, we, need, we need Satan, surely. We need Satan, obviously. We need a bunch of space sirens that take people to the slumber zone. And we, need, we need Harry Mudd, clearly, you know. Uh, absolutely. Uh, sex trafficking, war criminal Harry Mudd. Well, exactly what you want for a kids show. Well, watch out, because, you know, they've just been recommissioned for a second season. Who knows what they have up their sleeve. But, yeah, I'm excited for it. You know, there's a lot to be excited because we've got that and Discovery starts next week. And then, you know, Strange New Worlds, which um, everyone is excited about. And Picard season two. That's that's the thing. Oh, dear. Okay, right. (laughs) I did. I know. I know. I brought Picard onto it. But only because I love that show so much that that one just really stood out. I need to watch it again just to remember whether it it is as bad on second watch as it is on first. I don't know if I can give the, all of season one of Picard my attention again, but I am excited for season two. I'm going to see Elnor again. That's great. Fair enough. Well, we great, to, we <laughs> great to talk to both of you and enjoy the rest of the con. You too. Yeah, I'm writing something about uh, this sort of phenomenon of reinventing grown-up uh, franchise entertainment, whether it's films or TV for kids. So I'm kind of interested for you was that a big part of the appeal of coming back to Janeway after all these years, but specifically playing her for kids this time? Well, I have to tell you the truth. When you live action Janeway was, uh, as I'm sure you're very aware, very significant to me and uh, life defining, life altering and defining. So I, I really hesitated at first when that Scriptsman offered it to me. I thought, oh, is this reductive? Shall I be reduced to a, a, a recording booth? I said, let me have a little time to think about it. And I, a lot of people said to me, are you crazy? Children will adore it. And their mothers will share it with them and educate them. And it will become a sort of family affair and an, an, a, a cross-generational affair. And I thought, that's exactly right. Children are the perfect audience and the one that we've sort of been most negligent about. <laughs> so uh, I called Kirsten back and I said, I'd love to do it. And to tell you the truth, it's been frankly a great, great pleasure. Yeah. It's interesting, my, I have a six-year-old, and Voyager, yeah. of all the Star Trek shows, is the one that he responds to. I haven't shown him Prodigy yet, obviously. But, um, so I think there is something about Voyager in that show and that kind of sense of family <laughs> mm-hmm. that kids respond to right. as well anyway. So maybe there's something about Janeway that she's 
She's a character. Every someone kid. was asking, is she more approachable? Well, Maybe she, she is. is more for children. She's the more yeah. likable captain. Do you know what I mean? She's well, she's I think more she's, like the more she's the more accessible captain. Yeah. Yeah. Children love and respond to a good mentor, yeah. but there has to be empathy in that mentor. Yeah. I've never met a child with any intelligence at all who didn't immediately understand that an adult was trustworthy or not. Mm -hmm. This Janeway, prodigy on prodigy, is very empathetic, mm -hmm. and she's full of fun, and she lets them fall, and she lets them get up. And together, I think they learn these characters. Uh, some of them are not human, of course. Uh, that she is not only to be trusted, but that it can be an exciting journey. And that's what children really love. And for you, do you play her differently? I mean, we only saw a little bit in the show yesterday, but do you approach her differently than you did playing, I'm just thinking, say, with Lower Decks, I don't know if you've seen the, the cartoon for adults that they've been doing, you no. have someone like Jonathan Frakes playing Riker, but it's a sort of, it's a different version of Riker. Do you know what I mean? Are you playing Janeway very much as the same hitting the same kind of notes or are you conscious she's lighter. the kids and they're very she's happy. lighter in the beginning until and of course uh, there's trouble uh, Dahl the, the lead character is a can be quite um, his ego is leading him most of the time and most of the time into trouble so uh, as hologram James I just sometimes let him fall but when I come back, it's always with humor. Oh, I'm welcome. I guess now I can come back on the pitch or in trouble. So it's funny. Kids will get it, you know? Yeah. They can they can re relate to both temperaments, both personalities. Yeah. And what about the hologram aspect of it? Is that something you're kind of conscious of? Yes, I'm conscious of it. So you worked I... with Picardo for years, you know, playing a hologram. Yes, well, of course, he's the master. Right. I mean, <laughs> so skilled. Well, unprecedented sort of voice actor. And what he brought to the doctor, yeah. which was not on the page, was astounding. He is, as you know, my great personal friend. Um, I try to, uh, there are nuances and subtleties that I try to bring to Hologram Janeway. I try to bring a, a sense of lightness and delight. And when the fear is real, a fear that children can understand. I don't want to scare them. I want them to understand fear. I want them to understand we're in a difficult situation and we're going to get out of it. So there's something in the voice then. I lend a certain quality to my voice that's almost excited, that's hopeful, that shows them promise. Because children, if somebody says, this is really going to, children will back up. But I sort of try to invite them at all times. Fantastic. Great. Thank you, Kate. You're very welcome. So I'm here with Noah Averbuck Katz. Uh, is this your first UK convention? This is my very first UK convention. I've done some in the States, mm -hmm. uh, but I've been having a great time here. Uh, the English fans are wonderful. They've been very nice to me. They get very confused why I talk to them so much, but I think, you know, they want to be polite and move the queue, but they get into it and they're like, maybe I'll stick around for a little bit. I think we know you're kind of living the dream, right? Because you're, you know, you're one of us. You're it's a fan true. who yes. has ended up being in Star Trek. Yes. What's that like? Oh, man. It's just so much fun, you know? I, 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 growing up, I never really thought I would be on the show because, like every Star Trek fan, the show is real, so you couldn't be on it, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just been a lot of fun, and, and it's been so great. You know, when I was I was shooting, I wasn't sure if I would sort of be able to come to these things, if I'd get invited to these things. And I was really, really wanting to because I know as a fan, like, this is almost like, for me, it was like half the experience of shooting the show and then half the experience is the fan experience, you know, even as an actor. So I've just been really, really happy. I've gotten to go to so many conventions and interact with so many fans and everyone's been so excited and nice. It's just been... It's been a lot of fun for me. And I guess you were kind of prepared for that, because I know a lot of the Trek actors, when they come to their first convention, they're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know, but you'd, you'd been to some as a kid, right? Oh, yes, I went to uh, quite a few when I was a kid with my mom and some friends. The last one I went to was in 2012 in Chicago, so relatively recent, especially sort of like post pre-new Trek, you know? I was ready, but I also was like, <laughs> the very first convention, I was like getting up from the table and like, 
you'd be like, hey, what up? Come over here. What are you doing? You know, like interacting like from behind the table. And it really confused people because they were like, yeah, you're not, you're pushing it too far. Like I'm, you're freaking me out because I'm, I'm, I'm like, am I in trouble or something? So I've learned, I've learned to, you know, stay in my seat and just enjoy and let people come to me. So it must have been helpful for Mary in a way, having your insider's perspective when she started coming along to the convention. It was helpful and it was also terrifying because I, she couldn't put off the inevitable. I showed her early on, I showed her two Star Trek things because she didn't have a lot of time to like prep, you know? She couldn't watch all the shows. She basically had a weekend. It, it, the turnaround was super fast and she was working on plays. So I had her watch The Offspring, which is like my favorite Star Trek episode. And then I had her watch Trekkies. And then she sort of got the agony of the ecstasy of Star Trek in like one right. long sitting. So that was how I sort of prepped her for what she was in for. But now she's a pro. Now she's giving, you know, yeah, she's, that, she's <laughs> showing me how to do it now. Yeah. You know, yeah, she's, yeah. she's amazing at these conventions. The fans love her and she's so good at answering questions and, and giving really thoughtful, wonderful answers. I'm just usually joking off and she's giving these amazing, beautiful answers. So I, I'm taking lessons from her now. So was there a lot of lobbying on your part to try and uh, get you onto the show one way or another? I can imagine if that was me, I'd be, you know, pushing every chance I got. No, there wasn't any lobbying because, you know, she has to work. People have to go to their jobs. (laughs) and, And the truth is, you know, I didn't need to be on the show to enjoy and be excited, you know? I got to go on the sets. I got to walk around. I got to meet all the actors. I got to meet Jonathan. I got to meet all these people. I got to have a Trek experience for a fan of a lifetime already. You know, like, at the point I got the show, I had already experienced what, like, the dreams are for any fan. You know, walk the hallways of the the ship alone. You know, sit on the captain's chair alone. Meet everyone working on the show. Have everyone come over and show you every single prop. You know, get into touch and hold and just be around for everything. So... There, it wasn't. It didn't feel like, oh, it's imperative I get on the show to have the full experience. I felt like I already had it. The only lobbying that I accidentally did early on was one of the first times I visited Mary, they were doing a remote record of After Trek. And it was like the first time I was like around other people. And I had a bunch of pictures on my phone of me at as a kid at Star Trek convention. I was, And this was before anybody knew who I was. And... I was showing them to anybody who would talk to me for like even two seconds. And um, everybody was like, who the fuck are you? Leave me alone. Go away from me. Um, and uh, and I, show, I showed my picture to uh, Akiva Goldsman. And he was the first person who got excited. He took out his phone and showed me pictures of him from a convention in 1974. Oh, wow. And so we were going back, and we were like, ah, you know, we like we did the fan thing that I was yeah. looking for. Yeah. And we were just chatting all night long. He's like, oh, we'll get you in as an extra. And I was like, yeah. great, whatever, I don't care. Like, this is fun. Yeah, yeah, put, yeah. Do, I'll do whatever. And we sat down for dinner. There was like an after dinner. And me and Kiva were still talking. I sat down, he was on my right. And uh, and Akiva was like, look, like, I'm, I'm loving ch- chatting to you, but like, uh, you know, I think the person you actually want to talk to is this guy, Alex. And I was like, all right, sure, whatever. And I showed Alex the pictures. Of course, this is Alex Kurtzman, you know what I mean? So I'm showing him the pictures. And at first, he was just like, you know, very nice. Cool, cool. Oh, that's really neat. That's really neat. And as I was talking to him, uh, like a publicity person from CBS, like sort of interrupted. I was like, hey, do I, do I know you? And I was like, no, you don't know me from anything. I'm just like done a bunch of theater, a little bit of TV. And she's like, no, I do think. I'm like, I don't think you have. And she's like, oh, I remember you on an episode of... Um, of the Good Fight on CBS All Access because there weren't actually a lot of shows out on CBS All Access at that point. So they, I was like, you know, one of the guys who'd done the show, and in that moment, Alex was like, "Oh, he's not just like an insane husband. Yeah. He's an act. <laughs> he's a real actor who's like been on this network before Mary had been on it." Right. And I think at that point, it was like, "Okay, maybe we can, you know, down the line find a little spot for him." So that was the only sort of like lobbying if you will but it was really just timing, pure geeking you know yeah. what I mean yeah. so that's that's the only bit I did well I guess that's one of the things that these days it is fans who are in charge do you know what I mean back in the yes. 90s it was you know it was yeah. people like Michael Pillar in charge yes. who maybe had come you know had a writing background but were sort of coming to Star Trek and bringing their own stuff whereas yeah. now uh, you've got people obviously very successful writers but they're also you know they've grown up with it right well like Mike McMahon or you know mm-hmm. he's like 
pure fan and that's why Lower Decks is so much fun and so lovable it's just like this pure fan energy yeah I, I just think it's really fun you know having people who love the show work on the show is just so much fun you know especially so much of the crew on set love Star Trek and they really have a sense of every prop that they design or every mask or costume they design or even just handle or clean up or, or do any part of they really have a sense of being part of the legacy and I think that's a really fun energy to be around on set. So obviously Rin met an unfortunate end but we've seen actors coming back in especially if you're good at playing aliens if you're happy with the prosthesis yes. are we going to see you back under a different oh mask boy. sometime? You know of course everybody asked me that and obviously I would come back as the wall if they asked me. Right. Um, <laughs> you know it's challenging because back in the old days you had 24 episodes. The turnaround was a week. It was all in L.A. People were freaking out. You needed somebody who could trust. And that's why Jeffrey's coming back so many times, especially in the prosthetics, because to find somebody you can trust on the prosthetics in that amount of turnaround time who can do multiple characters, who's good, is really a challenge. It's a lot different now because this show shoots in Toronto, so there's a lot of international laws. There's a lot of international union laws, so you can only have a certain amount of American actors. The, the prep time is so much longer, so, you know, it's not just, oh, we'll make an alien. It's like, well, we've already written the show, and if you fit in, then you fit in. Um, so it's a much, it's a much steeper uh, cliff to, to, to climb. I mean, I'd love to be back, obviously, but even if I don't, in terms of what I got to do on Star Trek, I got to do such a wide range of things. I got to have this amazing full arc, you know, which I think on the newer shows has, you know, those side characters, there's not as much room for them because there's so much less time, so much as an episode. So to get to do that and to get to work with so many different people in the cast, you know, I, I really got to work with just about everybody in the cast. Uh, and I also got to work with Jonathan twice, you know. And so in terms of... Um, doing something like that it just it just doesn't really get better than that fantastic and um tell me a little bit about this dungeons and dragons <laughs> panel you're running later i have to say I, I confess i've never played a game of dungeons and dragons but i've always been kind of fascinated by it. is well, this something i'm gonna be able to comprehend what's going almost on? certainly not you almost <laughs> certainly have no idea what's going on okay. and in fact i think the people familiar with dungeons and dragons will also have no idea what's going on i mean usually a game will take like two hours, two and a half hours, and it's a bit more methodical, it's a bit interpersonal. We are probably going to have like 45 minutes, so it's just going to be like slam bam and we're going to run through it. But I, I, I think, you know, one of the benefits of being a Star Trek fan and coming to conventions is you understand what's fun at a convention. Yeah. And so, yes, there is, it doesn't really make sense why Dungeons and Dragons would be at a Star Trek convention, but it makes sense because a bunch of Trek people are doing it. And so you get to watch your favorite Trek actors interact with each other in a way that's really natural and genuine and that is sort of uncensored by a moderator or by trying to answer the question in a way that doesn't, you know, that, that, that makes people happy. You get to see them improvise and play new characters, you know, and, and show their other sort of creative and comic and goofy side. So in terms of, you know, why it's at a Star Trek convention, no fucking idea. I don't know why they allowed us. <laughs> in terms of like what it brings to a Star Trek convention, I think it's sort of that thing that every fan wants, which is to like be at the dinner table and hang out with everybody. So and that's sort of a the, It's a kind of geeky passion. Isn't it? Exactly. I guess that's the thing. And it's there nice has definitely to see. been a huge outpouring of like geek crossover mm -hmm. uh, that has also been very very fun as well yeah. especially now as D, D sort of grows in popularity and yeah and, you know maybe we'll have we'll, we'll we'll turn some people to the the D, D dark side it could happen yes it could happen <laughs> thank you noah and i'll look forward to the panel my pleasure man so it's day three of destination star trek i'm here with drew and tracy how are you guys doing very well thanks how are you doing not too bad. Uh, did you have a late night last night? I think I left by about half eleven, but you two were still going. No, no, I think we all left at the same time. Oh, did you leave? Yeah, at the same you don't time? remember. <laughs> I was obviously a bit the worse for wear, right? <laughs> Playing the trek against humanity. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was a good night. A bit too good, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. suffering yeah. this morning. Yeah, absolutely. Did you make it to coffee with Captain Janeway? Because I guess that's what you need after a night like that. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we uh, got a coffee and then we did the coffee with Janeway. Yeah, she. I mean, Kate Margot's excellent. She is amazing. Always got great stories. stories to tell and you know inspirational she's just got a 
great presence, hasn't she? Yeah. She just delivers her, her, her stories really, really well. So. I think she's best on her own as well, to be honest. Whenever you have someone moderating her, they kind of, after a while, they just sort of give up and, and let her do it. You know? I'm not sure what was happening this morning because it was Builder's uh, Coffee with um, Janeway. Yeah. But she did came on, came on and she said she was supposed to be with a crew, like on a panel. Yeah. But she was on her own. Yeah. So to be honest, that actually worked fine for us. I don't know who she was supposed to be with. No. It was a bit of a last minute. It all seemed a little bit chaotic, that side of things. But I think she's best on her own, to be honest, Absolutely. just because she'll just talk. You know, she could just Absolutely. talk for half an hour. <laughs> Great questions. And she has a wonderful way with the fans, I think. You know, she has a real sort of affection for them. Yeah. comes across in the way she answers the questions. The amount of time she called um, females who came up to ask a question, sweetheart, yeah. was just quite endearing. And, you know, yeah. she really listened to what was being asked yeah. and tried to answer, you know, as truthfully as I think she can, you know. I mean, she, get, she must get the same questions over and over again, yeah. mustn't she? So. Yeah. Yeah, no, she's, she's a good one. She knows what she's doing. I have to say, I i mean, like you, you know, it was a bit of a late night. I actually overslept this morning, so I was racing together. I didn't even have time to grab a coffee oh. before going in. But but it was a good way to wake up. She'll definitely, you know, perk you up in the morning. Yeah, I was going to say, we were literally here at nine o'clock this morning, yeah. were we? Not keen or anything. <laughs> nine o'clock? Wow, OK, because she didn't start till ten. Well, we thought we'd, we we kind of thought it was going to take us longer to walk from the hotel right. and get coffee and do whatever. But no, it was good because we had a, a chance to have a look around and it was quiet this morning. Yeah. And then obviously it builds up again. So it's good. Fair enough. You got any plans for the rest of the day? Uh, yeah, yeah. Disco does D&D. Keen yeah. D&D player myself. So I'm really looking forward to that. And Noah is just so entertaining. I, I could watch him speak about anything really and i'm sure D, &D which he's obviously real promoter of is going to be good yeah he's lovely i was just chatting to him earlier about that i mean i have to say i've never played a game of D, &D in my life so i've no idea if it's going to mean anything to me but i'll be there and you know if i need a primer i'll i'll let you two know and you can you can explain to me. Or I'll, I'll let Drew know. Yeah, okay, Tracy. Don't look at me. <laughs> You'll be in my car. No idea. <laughs> I said, how am I going to know what's going on? Yeah. And he's like, well, now's your time to learn. Yeah. yeah I don't exactly. think so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you two have a great time. Thanks yeah. for talking to me. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm here with one of the Trekkie girls. Sam, right? Ah, yes, it's yes. Sam. <laughs> Sometimes hard to tell with all the masks and everything <laughs> going on. Yeah. How's your convention been going? It's been a really good weekend. It's just been so refreshing to get out of the house and back with our fellow Trekkies again and with all the actors. And people made such a great effort to come this year. We, we weren't expecting too much. We've been blown away with what we've got. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I felt like Friday, it seemed a bit quiet, but definitely by Saturday, it had picked up a lot. And it feels, you know, maybe not in terms of the guest line up to some extent, but it sort of feels like the atmosphere is there at least. Absolutely. Yeah. Yesterday was, I was surprised how many people did turn up, actually. It was much busier than I thought. And you've been doing quite a lot of panels, right? You had the first panel of the con, I think. We sure did. We were doing a bit of Klingon, a bit of Klingon hoch. And yeah, we, 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 we don't, we're not allowed to say we open the convention, you know, that's right. for the opening ceremony, right. but we totally open it, don't we? You, you did the kind of soft launch, <laughs> yes, basically. Yes, that's right. And this was, I did feel sorry for you because you were meant to be doing it with Mary Chifo, right? Yes. Who is a fluent Klingon speaker, she's I think. She's very I good, she's a very are, good but... Klingon. I'm not, yeah. I'm not a fluent, <laughs> but I am far from it. I'm a very uh, beginner Duolingo, I'm quite far into du Duolingo to be fair, but, okay. but no, um, I came up with a presentation and I had kind of, made it with in mind that cancellations can happen anytime yeah, so yeah. i kind of built that in that's very wise <laughs> i think and i gather yesterday i'm sorry i missed it but you had your lgbt yes. panel which people have been raving about i heard people were in tears they were you, you know obviously really struck a chord there. it was it was good tears i didn't make anyone cry like no, okay oh, I'm sad. <laughs> but um, yeah it went really well it was a really wonderful atmosphere there was a lovely harmony on the stage and I think there was just a lot of love there. Uh, people were overwhelmed by how much love there was there. And I, I had said to the organisers beforehand, I think we're going to need a bigger stage. And we were proven right. It yeah. was absolutely packed. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, have a great rest of the weekend and hopefully see you next year. We'll, we'll certainly be back next year. You can't have DST without the Trekkie Girls. No, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Thank you. So I'm here with Prime Minister Boris Johnson, or at least the closest to him that we seem to have at the convention. I don't know if you want to reveal your real name or, or go incognito. I, I go by Fu Bojo. Very good. <laughs> F-A-U-X, as in the French for fake. Well, it would have to be, wouldn't it, being, being Boris Johnson. And you've made quite an impression on this convention already, I think. Yes, well, I don't know how many here will have remembered that I attended in 2012 as well. And that's the only other 
DST that um, that I've attended before this one. Um, but yeah, it's been very fun to come to this obviously somewhat reduced convention this weekend. It's um, it's really been worth it. I feel. You must have been mayor of London in the previous time, right? But you've since uh, risen in the ranks. I guess for someone, are you a professional, Boris, in person? I am. I have been for ten years. Right? Yeah. Um, so you must be one of the people who has celebrated his rise, his sort of stratospheric rise over the past few years. It's kept you in work, right? It's a real juxtaposition because um, I've been politically opposed to him. I've campaigned against Brexit. Mm-hmm. Um, against the Tories in elections generally. I even considered running against him in Uxbridge and Bryslip. That would How, be amazing. Yes, <laughs> although unfortunately Hillingdon Council Electoral Services says, and get this, oh, you can't put anything on the ballot that refers to Boris because the voters might get confused. I'm pretty <laughs> sure the voters are already confused, but then that's just me being political. I, I've got to say... I've had some people here um, saying that they um, that they voted for Boris, and um, I couldn't help myself a couple of times saying to them, "Sounds like you've never, it sounds like you've never watched Star Trek, but okay." I know it's not an obvious uh, kind of matchup in some ways, Boris Johnson and Star Trek, is it? They're kind of uh, definitely at odds with each other. It is true. I mean, obviously, I'm I, I I can clearly see myself as more of a mascot for London in 2012 and Britain in 2021 even if not perhaps the best mascot but one that's obviously popular with um, with people attending and i wanted to um bring that bit of fun to to people this weekend and obviously you know in, enjoy um other things meeting uh, characters from my favorite shows um being <laughs> um being actually noticed by john billingsley in his panel um, and and the Discovery cast in uh, in their panel and Kate Mulgrew as well. I think she was uh, she she was asking whether you uh, she asked whether you admired Boris Johnson or not. And I replied with a very firm no, which had the <laughs> entire audience erupting. In 2012, I introduced myself as Mayor of London, and only half the audience erupted. Right. Right. But her response then was. Who is he? <laughs> right. Okay. So she's uh, she's she's got uh, a bit I've, more knowledge of, of your you know your career in the period since then. I've got the recognition, I suppose, and uh, well, I, I suppose partly because um, Kate has been in London before, um, you know, uh, in a, another TV role or film role, regardless, <laughs> recently. Um, but yes, Kate Mulgrew, I've got you twice. <laughs> Funny thing is about Boris Johnson, I suppose, people do see him as this kind of cuddly character. Do you know what I mean? As much as we might dislike him politically. I mean, my son is six and he wanted to see a picture of who the prime minister was. So I showed him and I said, oh, he's this, this man. We don't like him. You know, he's corrupt and he's horrible. And he looked at him and he said, oh, he looks funny. I like him. So, you know, <laughs> this can explain a lot, I think. I mean, to... to be honest I'd, I'd still imagine that that your son would likely have more critical thinking than most english voters wow. and and his mind could more easily be changed than um, than some of them but again that's just me being political <laughs> let's hope <laughs> in know, the next 12 know, years you know <laughs> we can get him to, yes yeah. and i know of course uh, uh, I, I go on a lot of facebook groups and you get a lot of people objecting to to Star Trek being political, even in the content that's in um, that's in the series and such, and perhaps they haven't realised, but you know, it's always been political. Gene Roddenberry was a socialist. <laughs> I, I, I've been uh, I, ha- I have been putting on a couple of other recorded videos this weekend that uh, that it's been good to see that. Uh, we have so many dedicated Starfleet officers around us at this convention who are so willing to uh, to fight to and, and serve to save humanity uh, in ways that I, I surely have failed to. Very good. Thank you, Boris. <laughs> Th- uh, thanks very much. You can uh, check me out on um, you can check me out on social media, all over social media. Fobojo, F A U X B O J O. Or that's the same dot UK, phobojo.uk for my website. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I'm here with John Billingsley, who I think you were a last minute uh, sub for Bob Picardo at, at this one. Is that right? Story of my life. <laughs> Is that some kind of doctor's thing that you, you, you know, you can uh, some kind of medical exchange going on there? No, I think it's just a tragedy of my being. I was also a substitute at my marriage. My wife had another guy lined up, and he couldn't make it. So I got the call, 11.15, can you be at the chapel at 12.30? Well, it obviously worked out, I guess. Well, that's the thing. You always say yes, you know. Even if you're the second choice, don't turn the job down. Now, I know that while you've been here, you've been talking, as well as sharing memories of Enterprise, you've been talking a bit about the charity work you've been doing in recent years. Yes, I'm the president of the board of an organization called the Hollywood Food Coalition. We're based in Los Angeles, and essentially we provide a hot, forgive me, my voice is a little shot this weekend, a hot multi-course meal to all comers, primarily people experiencing homelessness. We also provide them with an array of emergency services, clothing, access to shelter, access to counseling, and additionally, we rescue almost two million pounds of food a year and share it with other social service organizations. And we work with a variety of not-for-profits in the community to try and repair a broken social safety net. Seems like this is something, I mean, I don't know about in the States, but certainly over here, we've had more and more food banks opening. People have been turning to these things. You know, food poverty is a problem that's really on the rise. Is that the case in America as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I would go farther than that and say it's a function of global inequality. Um, poverty has all sorts of measurements. One of the key measurements is, of course, access to food, access to water, access to job opportunities, access to health care. In a world in which a very, very small portion of the population controls 75% of the resources, you're going to have endemic poverty. So it, it is, a, 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 to me, the single most important issue of our time. We've been fighting a war on poverty from the beginning of time. You can never win it entirely, but we tend to be, I think, as a, as a, a species, um, inclined to... Um, inclined to look away when we feel we can't solve something. And it's not about necessarily solving the issue of poverty, but it is about always recognizing that you have to give your best shot at it. And has COVID been an extra challenge for that, presumably? I mean, organizing these kind of public distributions and so on must be difficult in those circumstances. Well, I mean, you can see the disruption of supply chains all around the world is having a very deleterious effect in a lot of ways on our economy. It certainly is true for food, for food distribution, restaurants closing, agricultural supplies dwindling in part. Um, we're coming out of some of, of that, some of the crisis that was driven by um, food shortages. But the distribution issue is still with us, and the cost of food and the availability of good food in all communities is always going to be a problem. We have uh, food deserts, communities where they may have access to food, but it's convenience store food, it's junk food. So the question of good nutrition also comes into play. And a lot of what we try and do is also just make sure that the people who really have have the hardest challenges, people who are experiencing homelessness, get a really good meal every night because we really believe that food is the way in. You're not going to get a lot of um, uh, a lot of help to folks if you don't provide them with a good meal first. Obviously, in Star Trek, they've kind of moved beyond all these problems. You know, whether that's because of the replicators or they seem to have done away with capitalism. I mean, do you think, looking forward, can you imagine a future where that kind of Star Trek uh, world system might be possible? Do you have hope for that in the future? Um, I, I, it's a complicated answer because I, I think our tendency to think that if you can't imagine a perfect world, it takes you off the hook from doing anything today is a cop-out. So I don't spend a lot of time thinking about whether there will ever be a utopia, but I do have an obligation as a citizen to do what I can do in my little corner of the world to make the world a little bit better. And that obligation is part of everybody's consciousness, or should be. If you're going to get to that perfect world, it just starts with you in the mirror, you know? Fantastic. Thank you, John. Hope you have a good convention. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I'm here with Ninar Visitor. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Ninar, we spoke a couple of years ago for the DS9 25th anniversary uh, in Birmingham. But this time you're here not just as an actor, but as a writer. Is that right? Yes, it is. Uh, I am writing a book called A Woman's Trek, and it's concerning 55 years of Star Trek women, the culture that they were in, as well as the women they managed to inspire. Because there's always been a bit of a dichotomy, I think, with Trek, that in some ways it's this very utopian, progressive franchise. And at the same time, in pretty much every series, up until the most recent ones anyway, there have been backstage stories that are quite unpleasant. I mean, in the original series, there was one of the actresses left after a sexual assault. There's been, you know, a lot of uh, Gates McFadden left after rows with male producers. It's a, it's a difficult subject to get your head around in some ways. Well, I mean, we were definitely stuck in the culture of our times. And in the 60s, tw uh, all the way through the 2000s, there, there, were, there were cultural influences pulling us back, making us work twice as hard, making some women, you know, in my industry give up or give up their integrity. Uh, and it's fascinating, you know, not only did... Uh, Major Kira inspire women. She inspired me too. When you drop thoughts into your head, you start living those thoughts and they manifest themselves in your body and in your brain, actually changing synapses. And I felt the benefit of pushing my thoughts towards closer towards what Major Kira's were. I was interested uh, previously hearing you talk about when you were pregnant and you gave birth and having to go straight back to work, which I guess is the kind of thing Major Kira probably wouldn't have uh, put up with. But in those days, that was the expectation. I mean, it's, it's kind of unbelievable. That's what you had to do, right? Well, the expectation was as an actor that I would be fired, that I got pregnant and that wasn't who they hired and they would fire me. And that I wasn't was such a great testament to the writers and the producers and especially, I have to call out Iris Stephen Bear's wife, Laura, who came up with the fantastic idea of a shuttlecraft accident. And you had that great line to Alexander Siddig, this is all your fault. <laughs> it was East, an Easter egg before there was a name for them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so where did the idea of this book come about? Uh, I was approached by the publishers and the shape of the book was very different than what it's turning out to be. I don't think any of us knew what we were going for until I started to do the interviews and get into the work. And it's a woman's trek in terms of all the women in it and who were affected by it, but also personally for me, because I'm finding that I'm on quite a journey as well. And have you spoken to some of the women in current iterations of Star Trek now about how things, you know, hopefully have changed in the current landscape? Yes, I've been able to interview uh, a few of them so far. I hope to get, it, it, obviously, as many as possible and behind the camera as well, because they do have quite a few behind the camera. And I'm so impressed and so happy to see such a change. And there is a change. And these women support each other, which is, uh, uh, one of the, it, it's just a joy to see that. Because Deep Space Nine, I suppose, you know, you had these amazingly strong female characters, Dax and Kira, but it was a show that was written pretty much exclusively by men, right? It was, it was very much a male environment on the creative side. That's right. But um, we had a, 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 a huge friend in uh, terms of Ira Stephen Bear who wrote brilliantly for women. And I understand you've also been doing a bit of research in terms of going back and watching some of the other Star Trek series. Are there any characters in particular who stand out to you that you're kind of discovering afresh now? Absolutely. And I have to say Janeway, Bellana, uh, these women, as well as the women on Discovery. Uh, I haven't gotten that deep into Picard, uh, but... it. There were, there were the, the, the workhorses that I hadn't really delved into that I started to go, my God, not only what the character is doing, but what this actor is doing with that character. Yeah. So impressive. Fantastic. Well, best of luck with the book. Thanks, Nana. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. 
so I'm here with Wilson Cruz. How's the convention going? Good. It's last day. It's starting to uh, peter out a bit, but here we are. You're someone who always seems to have a lot of energy for these things. Oh, I'm glad you think that. <laughs> Well, it comes glad, across on stage. I'm glad that I put that across. <laughs> I, I try. You know, I know that people are spending their good money and they're here to see us and I want to be present. But, you know, three days is a long time. It is. Yeah. Especially after the last few years, we're not really used to this level of interaction, right? It, it can be a bit of a shock. Right? That is the absolute truth. Yes. I'm interested. A lot of the panels about discovery and a lot of the conversation around discovery has been about this issue of representation. Yeah. And it seems to me you're someone who throughout your career, you've kind of played that role in a sense do you know what I mean you've been in these shows that have been kind of pushing things and um, you, you know offering that kind of representation is that something that's important to you in itself in a way aside from the actual the roles that you're playing um, yes I feel um, I feel as someone who felt really invisible as a young man and and was a connoisseur of pop culture and um, and and delighted in it but still felt invisible in watching it that when I became a part of it felt a responsibility to um, expand the choices for people like me and and others and I always felt that um, the media could do a better job of helping people see themselves you know when you don't see yourself in pop culture you feel invisible and there's nothing more debilitating to a to a happy life than invisibility um, and I think we've, I think Discovery has done an exemplary job of trying to help that. And Star Trek had a bit of a problem with that for years, I think. I mean, you know, even when there were shows like Ellen, there were other shows bringing on, you know, LGBT characters. Yeah. Um, and Star Trek was kind of resolutely not doing that. And then we had, you know, obviously with Discovery, I think it was that scene with the toothbrushing, wasn't it? That was the key moment in a way that we saw a gay couple just living their life in a sense. And that was incredibly powerful. Yeah, I think there were people... Uh, I think there were powerful people in the Star Trek creation universe who were dead against including LGBTQ people. Um, and those people had to go away in order for us to make progress. And it seems like it's just getting better and better in a sense. I mean, with season three, we've got trans characters and so on coming in and trans actors coming in. Um, it definitely feels like Discovery of all the Star Trek shows is the one that continues to kind of push that progressive envelope in a way. Yeah, I said last year, uh, I before season three started, we were going to have the queerest Star Trek in, uh, in history. And I think we fulfilled that promise. Fantastic. Thank you, Wilson. Thank you. So I'm here with Martha Hackett, who played the villainous Seska in Star Trek Voyager. People often talk about Voyager in comparison to Deep Space Nine as this show that wasn't really serialized. But you had this real arc, you know, in the early years of the show. Did you know going into it uh, what kind of a role Seska was going to play, that you were someone in disguise? Uh, no, not at all. I had no idea I would turn out to be a spy. Right. Uh, I was just told by the producers that um, I was a member of the Maquis, the Rebellion, a little grouchy about joining the Federation and they weren't quite sure what they were going to do with it. So it, um, you know, it kind of rolled out in that way. And so I didn't really know that I was going to become this Mata Hari <laughs> un until later. So how did it feel when you got the script and realized, oh, I'm not a Bajor and I'm a Cardassian and presumably many more hours in the makeup chair as well? It's kind of fantastic, really, because it, it was suddenly I was much more defined. And so my objective was clearer to me what I was, where I fit in. And it's always fun to play conflict, you know, <laughs> to create the conflict. So, no, it was, it was fantastic. Yes, the makeup took getting used to. But I, I am one of those actors who finds that the masks really give me the characters. I, I, you know, for me. And it was great in a way that we had, obviously, Voyager, uh, we had Janeway, this female captain, and then we had this female antagonist. And although, you know, there was the Kazon who, you, you know, you had your Kazon husband, who was the male figure, it seemed like Seska was the one in charge. Yeah, so I, I always say that Seska was the brains and the Kazon was the brawn. Right, yeah. And I saw that I needed them for that. But they really, I mean, those episodes are sort of funny because Kala, you know, they, they can't figure things out. They wouldn't be able to do anything without Seska. And, and he just pretends to be mucho macho. You know what I mean? It's, it's, they're actually kind of comical, those episodes. 
So they, they wouldn't have gotten anywhere without her. <laughs> I heard you saying at one of the panels yesterday you were disappointed you didn't get more of a big uh, death scene, you know, more of a dramatic... I know, end. I know, it's rather silly of me to say that. But um, lots of people agree with me that I just felt she was a powerful uh, nemesis yeah. and that maybe it should have been a, a different way of being taken out, you know, by... S- by Janeway, perhaps, or, or some, yeah, yeah, higher stakes, yeah. personal, personal yeah. stakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chakotay, you know, exactly, which would have been a real moment of truth, yeah. you know, for him. So, um, but they, that's dark, yeah. and nobody in the Federation kills people really if no. they can help it. Not until you get so, the card and now, you know, right, <laughs> and now we get seven right. and nine on a, a revenge yeah. spree, but yeah, right, back so, in those days, exactly, that was so, not the thing, yeah, no, yeah, no. yeah. yeah. But of course, you did come back that one time. I think my favourite, Seska, is... Oh, right, yeah, yeah, more than once, more than once. But I was going to say in the hologram version, worst case scenario. That's my favourite, Seska, I think, because she's just so devious and and deliciously evil there. Yeah, that one is is Seska unmasked. And she looks Bajoran, you know, but there's no need to to pretend anymore. And and so I'd created this hologram to haunt them just in case. But it's such an evil thing to do as well. You know, imagine you're planning your exit and you're like spending that time, you know, working away on the computer, developing this hideous uh, ordeal for them to go through. Because I can. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much, Martha. I hope you have a great weekend. Oh, thanks so much. It has been a great weekend. So I'm here with Andrew Robinson, Garrick from Deep Space Nine. Uh, How's it going at the convention so far? Oh, it's, it's a lovely convention. The people are great. Everybody's happy to be out and about. It's amazing having, you know, not had anything like this for the last couple of years. Finally, we're sort of able to come together again. Absolutely. And it's important, too. And I find that people are, I think, genuinely grateful to still, to still be healthy and alive. And, and, it's, and it's showing. It's a great spirit here. Now, I'm afraid I missed the panel you were doing yesterday about LGBT representation in Star Trek. But I was interested that you were playing a role in that because Garrick is one of those characters who exists in the kind of earlier time in Trek where they weren't quite sure how to represent those things. But do you see Garrick as a queer character, essentially, now? No, he's not a queer character. And I I really don't, you know, I mean, basically... See, my my whole thing is sexuality is sexuality. Whatever you are, you are. And and I know that, you know, we we have to... it, it, it It gets complicated and it gets confusing. But Garrick loves sex he loves sex with people that he's attracted to regardless of you know what gender they are and and that was an acting choice that i made uh to play a a cardassian an alien i had no idea who these people are so that was simply an acting choice that i it was very successful to me and i'm deeply moved that it meant something to a whole community of people and that that uh panel yesterday was really moving thank you andrew so i'm here with elizabeth Dennehy, uh shelby from next generation and now lower decks we've seen shelby coming back recently oh in lower decks yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah very yeah. happy to see that she's a character that's kind of left a long mark on star trek i think just from being in those two episodes you know what 20 30 something years ago 30, 30 years, years ago, ago is it yeah. wow 30 Gosh. years yeah I'm curious. I know at the time there was a question mark about Patrick Stewart's contract negotiations and they, were, they wanted to float this idea that he might not be coming back. Were you been. hopeful that, you know, you'd end up as the new number one? That you'd be a sort of series regular at that well, point? I wouldn't have wanted to replace anybody and I have no idea if there's any truth to the rumour. What, what's important for everybody to remember is when we did the first episode, we didn't see the second script. And we, nobody well, they had, written it, right? They had, yeah. Well, yeah. maybe they had, but they yeah. weren't sharing it. Yeah. So we yeah. had no idea what was happening when we were filming the first, the first story, mm-hmm. and then you had to wait over the summer and find out this, what happened. So, I've somebody's kicked around that they were using that as an impetus to get people to re-sign the contract to say, you know, we can replace any of you. I have no idea. I have no evidence to support that. The story that I heard about the script, anyways, Michael Pillar had written part one, and then. Uh, he wasn't expecting to have to write part two himself. And then they were like, no, no, you've got to do it. And he was like, oh, I've got to find a way out of this problem, you know. Maybe, maybe yeah, it's yeah. entirely true. Yeah. Was it an interesting moment? Because I think for fans of Next Gen, that was in some ways the point that the show really turned a corner and became this massive hit that everyone was obsessed with. Were you kind of aware of that going onto set, that there was kind of excitement around that episode? Or was it just 
a job like any I other. I had no, nothing to compare it with because right. I never watched the original series or Next Gen. Sorry, I'm, I'm coming clean. <laughs> so I had no, nothing to compare it with. And Jonathan even said to me, you have no idea what, how your life is going to change. And I said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And he said, conventions. He said, people are going to be really mad at you. Yep. Really mad at you. Yep. And I said, I was like, yeah, whatever. I didn't know what he was I had no clue no no clue what he was talking about so he was right she's a great character though because I think even if you whether you love her or you love to hate her she has kind of made that mark I mean in the novels she had quite a big role I think I don't know if you're familiar with that whole world obviously you know popping up in lower decks there is this kind of sense she's someone that hasn't been forgotten about do you know what I mean she yeah. made her impression and well, you know you're here 30 years later and people want to talk to you about it because she was right Okay. She was <laughs> interesting. She yeah. Knew yeah. How to solve the problem and there were people in her way. Mm-hmm. And I think that what's really interesting is 30 years ago people would come up to me in conventions and say, "Oh, I hated you. You were such a bitch." Yeah. I don't hear that anymore. Um, which I think is a testament to how things have changed in terms of equality. Mm. And I think that the people who object to Shelby have to admit it's because of the tone yeah. and the lack of deference to the man in charge yeah. and now that's becoming more and more acceptable yeah. and people kind of respect her whether they agree with her or not there's something about you know she knows exactly what she thinks and what she's going to do and she knows that she's right it's, if they're if they don't agree with that they're kind of being left behind in the dust i'm sorry to say but they are because um, she was a problem solver. And so everybody keeps coming up to me and saying, oh, you had a bee in your bonnet about Riker. You really uh, had a contentious relationship with Riker. And I don't remember it that way at all. I had a problem to solve with the Borg. I had a contentious relationship with the Borg. The Borgs was my problem, not Riker. Amazing. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's great so to welcome. talk to you. You're so welcome. <laughs> so I'm with Hannah Cheeseman, area mark two from Discovery. Um, is this your first London convention? It is my first London convention, and uh, I hope it's not my last. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You've been having a good weekend? I have. I, I got in very early, no, not even very early. I did a, a, in a red-eye flight on Thursday, got in on Friday, and rolled into the... Wow. the co- yeah, it was yeah, a bit... In, you know what I mean? It was a bit intense, but uh, I actually was too late for the opening ceremony because the cab took two hours to get to my hotel. I'm just learning. I'm just yeah. learning about London. Yeah. Uh, it is my third time in London, but it's my first time at the Comic Con, the, the, the destination track here. Um, and I'm having a great time. Honestly, it's like good vibes. It's fun. It's light. And it's also a reunion with all of my Star Trek pals. You know? I bet. Yeah, yeah, because you sadly were killed off, weren't you? You, oh, you, you know, God, wasn't I, though? I really I really was just sucked out into space. And it was yeah. very tragic. It was tragic. And, you know, some might say too soon. Yeah. Some, yeah. some like me, might yeah. say too soon. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, though, with Star Trek, death's never completely final. There are always ways. And you came back in the Mirror Universe, didn't you? I did come back in the Mirror Universe. So it did happen once already. However, in Prime, I had my, like, memory, like my brain chip, if you remember, like, scanned to empty. And... And so I just, I worry, well, who knows what I could come back as anything then, you know? Yeah. I, I Hologram. Or, you know. I'm ripe to come back as the Borg, don't you think? Oh, yeah, that would be an interesting one, yeah. Because we've had the Borg Queen come back in two different incarnations. We've had Alice Krieger back in Lower Decks, and we've got a new Borg Queen in Picard. So, yeah, you know, could be Mark Three. And, you know, I don't even have to be the Queen. You know what I mean? I can be her consort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? fair enough, yeah. yeah. I was quite interested yesterday, you were talking a little bit about working uh, with Sarah, who was the original Arium, and that kind of handover. Now, obviously, in Star Trek, we've had different actors playing the same role before, but usually it's because it doesn't work out for one reason or another. Like in DS9, there were a couple of cases where someone just couldn't cope with the prosthesis and so on. It ended up going to someone else. But I don't think I've ever heard of an example of the two people sort of working together in that way. That must have been quite an interesting process. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, obviously... Sarah is a loved member of the Star Trek family and uh, she was totally honestly and this is not some like PR spin or anything like that she she was so generous and uh, open and with her time and with you know sort of showing me what she started with so that I had a really strong base to build off of 
Um, so yeah, it was like a strange, unexpected collaboration, you know, and uh, and yeah, it was really good. It was good. It was helpful. Yeah. How much of Arium's story was kind of in place when you took over the role? Because I, although, you, you know, you had that very tragic exit, but I saw a lot of people were sort of complaining they should have stretched this out longer. Do you know what I mean? We should have got to know more about her for a while before she suddenly disappeared because it felt like it was all packed in. It was very emotional and very intense. Um, had you kind of been familiarized with that backstory? Had they told you about that beforehand when you were playing the character or did that just arrive, you know, that week and you're like, wow, I've got all this stuff to get my head around and then I'm out the airlock. Yeah, well, obviously you have your own ideas of what, what your, your character's backstory might be if you don't if you don't know it beforehand. And to be honest, because the, there's so many safeties around, you know, not wanting to disclose too much, just like safety and sensitivity for the franchise, for the, the, the series, and for the characters within it, I actually didn't know until, you know, I, I got word and, air, you know, heard of, of some things that would be coming, but it wasn't until I read the script that I really understood, you know, where I came from what my history was and you know what that was, would evolve into and and where she landed you know thank you hannah it's been great talking to you and hope we see you again sometime soon uh, i would be my pleasure to come back so just let them know they should so i'm here with garrett wong garrett you're doing sterling service at this uh, convention you're representing voyager just you and kate between you for the big anniversary right well since everyone else dropped out i have to go above and beyond with every fan interaction that I come across. Absolutely. And I think Kate even promoted you finally after 25 years, <laughs> yeah. right? In recognition yeah. of your yeah. service. She yeah. said, I'm going to promote him since he's the only Voyager cast member to make it here. <laughs> kind of like a lifetime achievement award. It really is. I, I feel like I'm the queen of the ball now. So. so you're here as an actor, but you're also here as a podcaster these yeah. days. Those yeah. of us who've been doing pa fan podcasts for years, now we have to compete with, you know, you pros. You do, you do. Um, yeah, the podcast started in May of 2020 during the pandemic. It's something that I've had in my mind for probably over a decade, but my my partner, Megan, was the one that told me now or never. So she really, you know, lit the fire under my bum and I started it up and uh, she's the one that suggested I call Robbie and he agreed and the rest is history. We've been churning along. We're at four, season four right now. So that's amazing. Yeah, You've made point. you made good progress. It's really lovely to hear the two of you together, I think, because obviously, you know, we enjoyed that friendship between Kim and Paris. Oh, but yeah. to know that the two of you in real life have yeah. that kind of friendship, too, is really nice. Yeah. And that's that's really one of the main draws of the podcast. People really love the chemistry that we have. And that comes from you know, working together for seven years, 14 to 17 hours a day for seven years. <laughs> yeah, you get to know someone pretty well. Yeah, and Robbie, Robbie's a fun guy. I'm a fun guy. And so together, that synergy is, is, uh, is somewhat magical, I think. Yeah. Plus, it's great, you know, at these kind of conventions, you often get those questions from the crowd, people saying, so in this episode, this happened, and the actors are like, uh, oh, no memory yeah, of that whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. You two are going to be experts. Now we're going to be <laughs> experts about this. We, Robbie might not remember the name of the episode, but he'll be like, oh, yeah, that one where the blah, blah, blah happened. Right? Yeah. So that'll happen. A particular happen. lens was used. Yes, or, you know. <laughs> yes. He'll know I love that, getting that kind of really technical insight. Yeah. I think that's quite unusual. It's like those old DVD commentaries that people use. And frankly... When I used to buy a lot of DVDs, I would look for that if it did it have a commentary from the director or some of the actors because you really do get a little insight into into the production of that project that you never would have known uh, if there wasn't a commentary, right? So the podcast is really the new DVD commentary in a way. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. And you're working on the documentary as well, is I that am. right? Yeah. How's so that going? It's going well. It's the same folks that came, that brought uh, the, D the DS9 documentary, What We Left Behind. They're doing the Voyager documentary. And um, it's going, it's coming along. It's coming along slowly, but that's really because of the pandemic. You know, the pandemic has completely ch uh, changed a lot of the issues that uh, a lot of the times that they had already scheduled to record, um, they had to reschedule and then reschedule again, you know. So it will be finished uh, sooner than later, but uh, it has been quite a journey. Yeah. You'll get it done by the 30th anniversary, by any rate. Oh, my God. We better do that, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for talking to me, Garrett. Have You're a great welcome. weekend. Thank you for waiting. I appreciate it. So I'm here with Tony Lee, uh, MC extraordinaire of Destination Star Trek. It's been quite a year. It has. It's been a couple of years. Um, and it's, it's weird to be back. And at the same time, it feels so familiar. Yeah, it's been fun, I think. I mean, coming in this year, there was a sort of expectation 
is it going to be slightly quieter con than usual, a slightly uh, sort of smaller scale? But I mean, definitely on Saturday, it seemed to pick up quite a bit. It did. I mean, there's there's a lot of at this time there was a lot of um, various sort of regulations and things like that, and it slowed things down. But then most big conventions I go to, you have the queues and you have things like that. So I think a lot of people like know what was going on, and I think a lot of people also realise that because of the fact that there were all these roadblocks in the way, just even being here was good and that i think came out in energy in like the parties and stuff like that and i know there were complaints i know there were people un- unimpressed because maybe guests were wearing masks and stuff like that but at the same time these a lot of the guys who were here are flying back today and they're working to modernism all the discovery guys are they came here they literally go back to america and then they're doing the premiere so they're not even stopping they just keep going and they could easily have just turned around and said we're not turning up and uh, just the passion those guys have i think for this for the, the show is what keeps this going. And also, a lot of the guests, you've been working them hard. I mean, Kate Mulgrew, Garrett Wong, the two of them were kind of representing this big Voyager anniversary, and they were doing a lot of work while they were here. <laughs> well, I think they, they both felt that they had a, a lot of people's worth of meeting to do. Yeah. But again, I've seen uh, messages on the internet saying, oh, they're working them really hard, and that's hard. The guests choose their own deals. Right. The guests, and, and obviously, you know, the massive events and that wouldn't ever talk about this, but the guests make the deals before they come here they don't walk in and are told you're doing all this and they know what they want they want to meet the fans they want to do the photo shoots they're aware they're a bigger cues um yeah basically i mean kate and garrett are absolute consummate professionals and they were bar there were barbed comments at them several times about their co-stars and I, i felt sorry in a way because there are reasons why people couldn't be here but but garrett's great and kate's great and everything they did and they were so welcoming to all the fans uh, and even to the end, you know, they wanted to go to the, o- the closing ceremony. But, you know, again, we're in this world where you have to jump through hoops to even leave the country. So yeah, sure. yeah, and it was crazy. Yeah. But no, it's absolutely amazing. So what do we have to look forward to next year? Um, honestly, I don't know. Um, I'm just a host. I don't even know if they'll <laughs> bring me back. You know, after all the things I've done this weekend, they might have decided to fire me. Who yeah. knows? Um, I know we have Bill Shatner. Mm-hmm. Um, Bill... Uh, wanted to come back, obviously, after the last time he came, and now he's flown to space and he's an astronaut. astronaut. Maybe we'll have a panel with him in ESA, mm-hmm. where he'll lord it over them, saying, okay. I've been more into space than you have. Yeah. Um, I think, obviously, we'll have the Voyager people here, and that'll be good, because they'll be able to see the people and, and catch up with what they wanted to do. I know there are other names that they're talking to, and I'm hoping they turn up. But, to be honest, the thing I'm looking forward to is not the guests, it's the easing up of restrictions. It's a chance for people to go back to the old ways and, and to queue up and to, to go to the parties and, and to see things. And it's going to be earlier in the year, so it'll be sunnier and it'll be, um, you know, the, the, it won't be so cold at night, which yeah. is good. Yeah. And I think it'll be a lot better. I think, it, I think this, was the, this was the training wheels return to big conventions. Yeah. And if this was the training wheels return, I can't wait to see what they're doing next year because they're going to pull out all the stops because it's the 10th. Fantastic. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, Tony. If I'm not here as a host, I'll be definitely here as somebody getting signatures and stuff. Because, as I said, I've been a Star Wars, or Star Wars, I've been a Star Trek fan all my life. You know, and you know, it's just, yeah, I'm not going to stop. I'm watching Discovery when I get back. You know. Okay. <laughs> all right. Get some rest. Take care, See you next year. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Primitive Culture, and that will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm, to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more, available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host and distribute these shows each month, so we really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you can find all our details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd like to take a moment now to thank our associate producers on Primitive Culture, Amy Nelson, Clara Cook and Tony Black. Amy is a presenter of many other shows on the network, and you can find her on Twitter at at Miss Amy Nelson. 
Clara and Tony were two of the former co-hosts of this show, and they'll be popping back from time to time. You can find Clara on Twitter at at Clara Jean MC and Tony at at AJ Black Writer. You're blended already.